It is my pleasure to introduce Mark Miller from the Virtual Human Interaction Lab at Stanford University. Mark is a PhD student and he's on the academic market this year. His research centers on privacy and XR and some of the practical affordances of how this translates from the technology. I know we're all tired, so let's drink our coffee and actually start by giving a big round of applause and a big whoop for Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Britton. Thank you, um, Britton and Ben and the rest of the team for uh, all the work that y'all have done to put this together. Thank you so much for the questions and the answers and the more questions that y'all have contributed so far. I have to check every once in a while and make sure my brain hasn't fallen out on the floor. Um, I've very much enjoyed uh, all of this so far. So today um, I'm talking about privacy and XR, which seems to be one of the big topics, I'm coming from the perspective of a computer scientist and also a social scientist. Uh, my background is computer science. I'm also uh, co-advised by Jeremy Balinson, and so I come with an experimental eye. And so I'll be talking about some of the research that we've done recently, um, combining AI, combining uh, virtual reality that I think raises questions of privacy. The four points that I'll talk about in the lightning talk First off, a crash course into the technical aspects of virtual reality. Um, Jeremy mentioned tracking, rendering, and display. Uh, I'll be doing a deeper dive into that. Then what we can infer from this motion that VR uh, gets right now, um, every VR headset that you've seen today, used today, tracks motion. It's absolutely necessary. Uh, and then uh, talking about the identifiability of this motion. Uh, which goes beyond just inference into connecting different inferences uh, across these virtual spaces. Uh, and then lastly, talking a little bit about eliciting behaviors that you can get from virtual reality. So let's talk about tracking, rendering, and display. I promise um, you won't get too lost in the details here. I'm trying to keep this uh, straightforward. We've got uh, a cycle on the left that I'll be explaining, and we've got my con colleague Hansul on the right, who ha is in virtual reality and sees a couple virtual objects. What's happening in this scene is we start off with tracking. We have the human body, top left, uh, and we convert that into a 3D position, and that's done with the headset. Different headsets have different um, ways of tracking, but the idea is there is a 3D position that is measured. It's 3D with the blue, green, and red lines. Uh, there's a 3D position that is measured. It's necessary to be measured because that's the point within this computer graphics space in which you can render these virtual objects. So in order to see the, the front side of the sphere and not the back, to get the right lighting, to get um, everything that sort of makes this virtual world seem realistic, you need to render. You take this 3D position and you convert it into an image uh, based upon the virtual world that someone is seeing. Then finally, you have the display. The image is displayed to the person. You gotta convert that, those bits into photons somehow. And the, the user of the VR headset sees this image. Lastly, as a uh, recovering computer scientist and growing social scientist, we gotta add in behavior. People are doing stuff as they're going about this, uh, this virtual reality experience. So you convert from uh, the brain sees this information and acts in response to it. This loop happens many, many, many times a second. Tracking, rendering, display. Tracking, rendering, display. Tracking, rendering, display. Um, it's about the rate of 10 milliseconds for that whole loop. A blink is about 100 milliseconds. So in the time it takes for you to blink, we've got 10 moments of data through that VR headset. There's a couple takeaways from this. Um, to sum up, tracking usually consists of position and rotation of both the headset and the hand controllers. The example was position of the headset. That goes beyond um, just, just the headset. What I really want to stress is that this is absolutely necessary for rendering and displaying virtual content. You can't have a VR experience, you can't have an AR experience unless you're tracking this position. It's not like, GP, uh, it's not like uh, location data on your phone where you can turn it off or something like that. It's like 
GPS data for a GPS. If you don't have that, you don't have the technology. Um, this occurs in a very rapid loop, and it happens far fa faster than users can self-censor, which uh, Avi talked about a little bit, Ken talked about a little bit. This is uh, worth keeping in mind. So now that we know that this data is necessary for the operation of VR, okay, what do we do, what do, we do about that? There's a couple things that we can do. Um, I'm coming from this from a perspective of a social scientist who's also interested in privacy, and it's very much a double-edged sword. In, um, in each of these cases that I'll be describing, it's good in one side and, and a little scary in another. The example first here is using this motion data to diagnose kids, um, specifically boys with ADHD. As you might um, expect if you know a stereotype or two about ADHD, the Kids in this study, this is 2004, um, tended to move their body, whether you're measuring the head, the arm, the legs, um, moved a lot more, were distracted. Um, just any way you slice and dice the motion data, the kids that were diagnosed with ADHD moved more than the, the kids that were not. So this data will show you things like that. Um, there's another study about mild cognitive impairment. Um, patients with Participants with mild cognitive impairment uh, covered more distance in this virtual supermarket. They took longer and they paused more. What's interesting that I want to highlight is they also measured how many errors people were making, uh, how long the checkout process was. There was a, a handful of measures that they were using. What was interesting is that these ones stood out. And what this highlights to me is as people were in this Headset, they, they know they're being evaluated to some extent. And so they're being very intentional to do things correctly, to find the right ingredients, to pay the cashier correctly. And that wasn't enough to, uh, to sort of, uh, yeah, to, to, make, to, to sort of remove that difference. Um, they took longer. So, with all this motion data tracked over time, there's, there's so many ways to uh, pull out behavioral traces from it, whether that's time, whether that's um, motion, all of that. And in order to protect yourself fully, you, you have to protect each of those. And so it's not, it'll always be an arms race of protecting one thing, well maybe that gives, gives it away in another way. So that's something I want to highlight about this uh, particular study. From there, I should also mention the computer authentication work. Uh, this is around 2015 to 2020. Uh, it's a question of, we have VR headsets. Maybe we can do better things than simple passwords. And so uh, there's a couple ways to ask people to do something that functions like a password. So you can nod your head in response to an audio clip. I, the tiger comes on. You rock out. The way that you do that is different from the way someone else does that. Um, and this sort of functions like a password. And then on the flip side, it functions as identifiable information. Um, and that was the insight that led us to this research study that I'll be talking about. We had some data lying around from a previously completed study. This is an important detail because we did not set out to collect identifying information. We had this information. IRB was fine with it, all that, um, and it was identifying data. Uh, we pre-processed this tracking data, we trained some AI uh, models on this data, and we'll be reporting the accuracy of it. The data set was from 360 degree video that uh, people were watching. Um, people came in, watched these videos, looked around the space, moved around a little bit, answered some questions about how the videos made them feel. Um, we collected the position and rotation data that I talked about earlier, and we trained these models on four of these videos, it's about um, 20 seconds per video, and then we tested on one of the five videos. Even when this model was presented with 511, 511 potential options, the model was correct 95.3% of the time. Picture a 500 choice, multiple, uh, 500 question multiple choice test, 500 potential answers per question, and scoring an A 
I don't know if that's as hard as the bar, but you know. <laughs> to be serious though, this is, this is, um, this is uh, what, do, what do we mean when we talk about identifiable information, when we talk about identifying um, biometric data in something like BIPA? Um, and this is the, the questions that I have, and this is you know, what I want to be working on um, as we see the, the metaverse grow. So to describe a little bit about what the model is recognizing, it's recognizing headset Y, um, which is this blue line, it's this up and down Y, um, y axis value, uh, and it registers things like participants' height, posture, and headset fit. Vertical motion didn't change a lot in this VR experience. People weren't squatting down. People didn't look up and down all that much. Um, but height varied a lot in participants. So that's one of the features that this, this model really based its, its uh, findings on. Second one is uh, headset Z, uh, which is a forward, backward. In this experience, after every video, um, someone, uh, or every video that someone saw, they answered a question. And so they moved forward or backward didn't trip over things because we were watching them. Um, we have to keep the participants safe when they're in VR. Um, so people were moving back and forth to find a comfortable distance from this virtual um, billboard on which we showed them the questions. Uh, and then some of that is just where they happen to be. Uh, we've got uh, then controller roll and pitch, um, which uh, for those of you who aren't pilots or work with angles inspired by aeronautics. It's the tilt up and down and the twist uh, of these hand controllers. And I've got this illustrated on Hansel's hand here. People held their controllers in different ways at different moments. Uh, they tended to do a similar thing across this experiment, but it was different across people. So some, some people had the controllers down at their hands. Sometimes they were arms crossed. Um, and you know, you wouldn't think of that as your going through this virtual reality experience that how you cross your arms is somewhat identifying, but it is. So where do we start to go from here? Um, there's questions about what are the boundaries of identifiability? These sort of technical questions about more complex VR experiences, more capable ML models. Uh, what are some of these plausible avenues of misuse? This has been a, a reoccurring topic today. You know, how, how might people uh, violate privacy here. Who's, who's violating that? Whose privacy is being violated? Um, and then what can be done to better protect this data? Thanks for talking about that today. Um, one thing I want to mention is it's, um, the jury's still out, but there's some evidence that uh, it's possible to re-identify this virtual data with real world data. So if you happen to have the data of someone uh, walking down the street, you know, okay, it's a public setting. Uh, you can link that biometric data, uh, and biometric in this sense, I just mean the, the head and hands and the, the sort of the data that, that Connect is, uh, is uh, tracking. Uh, you can match that with this virtual real reality avatar. And so the, the boundary between the, the virtual world and the, the real world um, isn't, uh, isn't as sharp when it comes to this sort of identification. Uh, with the last handful of minutes, I want to talk a little bit about elicitation. Um, this is a preprint paper, so it hasn't been peer reviewed except by me. I kind of like it. I think you should uh, take a look at it. Um, these researchers put together a, a virtual escape room, and each of these puzzles in each room, uh, you're supposed to find a word at the end of it. And it uses some of these. Um, motion data capabilities that I've been talking about. So for example, uh, the player's asked to hold their arms out in this T-pose and that, that gives you uh, arm span, wingspan measurement. Uh, they also have people do squats and that um, correlates, they, they interpret that as, as fitness data. Uh, but things go, uh, Things go beyond that. Uh, there's a room that tests for color blindness by putting some of these letters on uh, color test plates uh, that you can see or can't see depending on whether you have red, green color blindness or not. Uh, and then this one is which languages do you know because the, word, the password is Apple and it's written in a handful of different languages. What part of the room do you happen to be looking at when you say 
the word Apple. Um, this was an example of, of what you can pull out from people in these virtual reality experiences. So just to um, highlight some takeaways, motion tracking is necessary for XR to function. This is here. We can figure out who gets this data, if it stays on the device, as soon as you start getting into social VR, how often do you want to see my hand move? Do you want to reduce the, the tracking fidelity? Do you want to reduce the uh, tracking rate? Um, and the, uh, but regardless, the motion tracking is, is necessary for XR to function. Motion can indicate private information, such as the presence of health conditions. A motion can be identifying and then that identifying data can connect different sessions across uh, XR, but then also across XR to real life. Um, eliciting this identifying information can be done subtly and without immersive knowledge. And as we were talking about with uh, eye tracking and, and beyond, future directions are likely to extend the breadth and the depth of data collected. So I hope I haven't scared too many of you. Y'all seem to be well, well versed in these risks. Um, but uh, it's sort of updates from, from the social science side about uh, XR and privacy. Thank you. Is the tracking only internal to the system or could be, it, it, will you do third party tracking? So I'm thinking about the sort of like arm cross or various other things, mm -hmm. right? Is my, right, it, it, would my headset be able to sort of detect that this person is the same person I saw last time right, based on their behavior, or is it only going to track sufficient information about my own behavior? It will, uh, well, if you're in a social virtual reality platform, that data is transferred um, to whoever is in the room that can see it. So that's the, that's the, that's the risk that, that most fascinates me, is here's this VR lurker, someone who's just sitting there. So, 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 just, sorry, so all the data for, from my headset is also going to the person sitting next to me because it, it needs to know how my body interactions are going to be viewed by yeah. that headset as well. If you want the, if you want the nonverbal behavior that, that Philip was talking about last night and that has mentioned uh, a handful of times, yeah, if you, if you want to see the fact that I'm throwing my hands around, I need to send that data to you. Yeah. On the positive side, why won't this eliminate Sir. every stolen car? Sir. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> On the positive side, why won't this eliminate every stolen car? My car can only be driven by me. I mean, yeah, I, I think that would. The question is, do we want that check every time we uh, go into the car? I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, it would. <laughs> I think so. Especially as you extend to different, different data streams and all that. All right. Thank you, Thank you all. <laughs>